Hello everyone, this is uh, Professor Hasselman, uh, Western Civilization to 1650, History 105. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the Italian Renaissance and Baroque painting. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, I've spent uh, uh, about a year in Paris and I spent a lot of time in the Louvre, uh, the, one of the main museums uh, full of a bunch of masterpieces um, in European history. And we're going to be talking today about um, some of the pieces that are in the Italian um, and Renaissance and Baroque period. Uh, the focus today is going to be on several paintings, particularly those of Italy, um, as we mentioned, the Italian Renaissance in class. And uh, right now we're going to just go through some of the paintings and um, learn about some of the, um, the movements that were going on. Now to begin, um, the le this lecture is going to focus on the immense and varied collection of, like I said, Italian painting from the medieval period through the early 17th century. And like many other European national collections, the French collections are strongest in Italian painting. For the obvious reason that for everyone in the world, the principal advances in pictorial history occurred in the loosely regulated series of city-states we now call Italy. Now, as we shall see, the French actually measured their own achievements as artists against earlier and even to them greater Italian precedents. Now the lecture deals with a few of the highlights of this collection from masterpieces by uh, Sima Bue and Giotto and the earliest geniuses of Italian art uh, to the paintings by the mysterious 17th century Italian master Caravaggio. Now emphasis is on the story of painting told through these collections as well as the history of the collection both in the French monarchy and in uh, the professional acquisitions of museum curators and directors in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now indeed, virtually the entire collection of late Gothic and early Italian Renaissance paintings was acquired by the Louvre in the 19th century and by its first great director, uh, Vivant Denon who, unlike French collectors of his time, was aware of the art historical importance of this painting. Now, the two greatest masterpieces of Italian painting from the late 13th and early 14th centuries in the Louvre were seized during Napoleonic times from the Church of San Francisco in Pisa. They entered the Louvre in 1813 and had a significant effect on subsequent French painting and the history of art as a discipline uh, by Semaboué and Giotto, respectively. They are clear manifestations of the gradual transformation in Italian painting from an anti-illusionist painting based on late Roman and Byzantine traditions to the creation of an independent illusionist realm for the picture in which space is evoked using a variety of devices and human figures uh, are fully volumetric and cast shadows. Now, Simabue was identified by the first art historian, Giorgio Vasari, as the creator of Italian painting and the teacher of Giotto. This large altarpiece, Madonna and Child surrounded by angels, is closely rooted in Byzantine traditions with its spaceless gold round uh, impl implacable adherence to compositional rules and decorative rather than illusionist drapery. Now it looks backward uh, to uh, a tradition of painting uh, that was more than 10 centuries old when it was painted uh, in the last quarter of the 13th century and it represents the Madonna enthralled in paradise surrounded by worshiping angels and holding the perpetual infant Christ on her lap. The painting transcends time, making no allusions to then contemporary costumes or jewelry. Let me get this present so it looks a little bit bigger. There we go. So here's the, the Madonna holding her child, and as it says, uh, uh, surrounded by worshiping angels. Now, by contrast, Giotto's important altarpiece, Francis of Assisi, receiving the stigmata, represents the saint not as an object of devotion for the viewer, but as a devotee himself, posed in a space-displacing manner with the drapery folds deeply shadowed 
to reveal the form of his body. And he looks up into the sky to the physical manifestation uh, of his vision of Christ, who sends the stigmata of his wounds from the nails of the cross to mark the body of the kneeling saint, which you can notice here and down here. Unlike Simabue, Giotto places the scene in space through his creation of a kind of set with an evocation of mountains, trees, and a church, and the small hermitage, or small city. And beneath the major scene are three smaller pictorial zones, called predela panels, that represent the vision of Pope Innocent II, as St. Francis prevents the church from destruction, the approval of the statues of the Franciscan order by the same pope, and a pastoral scene by the saint feeding birds. Now all this we are uh, hereby taught resulted from St. Francis's devotion and his vision of Christ. Now Fra Angelico, or Brother Angel, was the adopted name of an Italian monk born as Giodo di Pietra de Becchia, and known in his Florentine monastery as Fra Giovanni de Fiosole, one of the greatest religious painters in the history of Italian Renaissance art, Fra Angelico, painted almost exclusively for the church, decorating church interiors, the cells of monks, and other spaces in the monastery in which he spent the majority of his working life. This painting, The Coronation of the Virgin, like those of Cimabue and Giotto, was seized by the forces of Napoleon in 1811, after having been identified by Vivant de Non, the Louvre's first director, and entered the collections of the Louvre, and then the Musée Napoleon in 1812. It was originally an altarpiece in the church of San Domenico in Fiosole, a small hillside town near Florence. The large altarpiece from the 1430 represents the enthroned Christ crowning uh, the enthroned Christ crowning the Virgin on her entrance to paradise. Surrounding this event are religious and historical figures uh, who demonstrate both the timelessness of heaven and the depth of human time in Christianity. Now, throughout the 20th century, scholars have disagreed over its um, complete attribution to Fra Angelico, uh, with one British scholar thinking that the canvas was completed by Domenico Veneziano. Two small paintings, one of the Venetian painter Giovanni Bellini and the other by the Florentine master Domenico Ghirlandiao, were made for the private devotion of wealthy collectors and connoisseurs, rather than for a church. Now, Bellini's masterpiece, uh, Christ's Blessing, was made in the generation before G uh, Giorgione transformed Venetian painting. It situates Christ at the moment of his reappearance after death, wearing a garment designed to reveal his wounds, and already holding a holy book that prefigures those of the four apostles that were not yet written. Now, Christ's simple humanity makes him seem utterly human, and the care with which Bellini painted every aspect of the work makes it seem almost itself an act of worship. Now, the turning of the body of Christ and the directional gaze suggests that it may once have been part of a diptych, perhaps with St. Peter the Virgin or the Magdalene worshipping him. The painting entered the Louvre in 1912. Oh, it had been in the collection of Prince Orloff in St. Petersburg, and perhaps before that in the fabled collection of Catherine the Great. The second small panel, a Portrait of an Old Man and Child by uh, Domenico Giorlandau, uh, has been one of the favorite paintings in the Louvre since it was acquired in 1886 from a Florentine art dealer. Now, nothing survives to identify the two figures, and because of their anonymity, the painting has always been interpreted as a pictorial investigation of the ages of man. Yet there is no doubt that Gerald Landau 
represented a real person, and the sheer quality of the portrait and the almost grotesque features of his warted nose make us yearn to know his name. Now, the Louvre's collection of paintings of the uh, Mantuan artist Andrea Mantegna is one of the glories of the museum. Perhaps the most characteristic of these is the uh, Predella panel Calvary that was once part of a large altarpiece in the church of, um, uh, the church of San Zeno in Verona. Now the entire altarpiece arrived at the, uh, at the, excuse me, the entire arrived at the Louvre in 1798, but was soon dismantled, and the larger central panel, its two wings, were returned to Verona while two of the predella panels that flanked the painting are now in the museum in Tours, France. Now the sheer majesty of the work is extraordinary, with its columnar figures derived from classical prototypes, its clear perspectival construction, and its bleak landscape setting. The second painting by Mantegna is uh, that of uh, Saint Sebastian, the central panel of a large altarpiece painted about 1480 for the Gonzaga family. It entered the Louvre in 1910. Uh, Saint Sebastian was a third century Roman soldier who after conforming, con, con, excuse me, comforting tormented Christians uh, was martyred by order of the Emperor Diocletian, but later healed by a Christian widow. Perhaps the most mysterious painting in the Louvre uh, this work entered the collection uh, of Louis XIV after passing through the Gonzaga collection in Mantua and the superb collection of the English King Charles I. Uh, this painting is uh, the, kind of the featured masterpiece here called the Fête Champêtre or Concert Champêtre by uh, Giorgione in 1509. It may originally have belonged to Isabel d'Este, who is known to have inquired about buying a work by the artist Giorgio Bar Barbarelli, or Giorgione, following his death. The painting has been ascribed to many artists, including Palma, Vecchio, and Titian, both of him who worked in the studio of the short-lived but brilliant Venetian painter now known as Giorgione. Today, scholarly opinion uh, inclines towards Giorgione himself, although the work may have been completed by either Titian or Palma Vecchio uh, if it was left unfinished at the master's death. Now the subject of this painting, called either uh, Fête Champêtre, or Pastoral Festivities, or uh, Concert Champêtre, or P Pastoral Concert, has no real precedence in European paintings. There are no indications that it has religious significance, and most scholars think that it relates to um, the pastoral poetry with mysterious and emotional connotations known to have flowed among the aristocracy and intellectuals of Venice. Now, the featured figures are two clothed courtiers, uh, beautifully dressed, these guys right here, beautifully dressed and engaged in what seems to be a conversation. They are accompanied by two plump female nudes, right here and right here, one of whom seems to pour water from a pitcher uh, into a well, and another who seems to just have stopped playing the flute, perhaps because she's just uh, seen the shepherd and his herd in the middle ground. The landscape setting from the hilly regions of the Veneto is lush and warm, but the sky is streaked by clouds, and there is a hint of wind and impending stormy weather. Now, whether an allegory of the senses or an essay on the fragility of beauty, we will never know, as no document or poetic text has come to light that convincingly um, ex explicates the painting's mysteries. The work has had a profound effect on the history of French painting, and one cannot imagine the 18th century tradition of the Fête Galant from Watteau to Fragonard without it. It is also the single most important source for masterpieces uh, by Courbet and Manet in the 1850s and 1860s, and even, as this next painting shows, Matisse's La Luxe is indebted to this work. 
Now, Venetian painting has been contrasted with that of northern and central Italy for centuries. When Florentine and Roman artists were seen as obsessed with drawing and composition, Venetians, by contrast, were interested in color, the free manipulation of paint, and a tendency to be dramatic, showy, and overtly emotional. The Louvre's collection has long provided fodder for these historical cliches. Now, the greatest Venetian painter of the Renaissance was Titian, or Tiziano Vecellio, who dominated painting in the watery city during the first three decades of the 16th century. His two greatest paintings in the Louvre are both religious. The earlier of these, The Entombment, was painted about 1520, when the artist was in his mid-thirties, and was acquired for France by Louis XIV. The entombment represents the apostles, accompanied by the bereaved Virgin Mary, uh, carrying the naked body of Christ to the cave that would serve as his temporary tomb. The sheer weight of the body and the existence of a kind of divine floodlight that illuminates it at night make manifest both Christ's humanity and his divinity. Each head is a separate study of grief and intense emotion. The second of the two great religious paintings by Titian in the Louvre is the crowning of thorns, an immense altarpiece commissioned in 1540 for a church in Milan. It was seized by the French military and entered the Louvre in 1797. Now, the sense of physical activity and motion of agony and human pain that Titian imparts to the scene is remarkable in the history of art. And his inclusion of the marble bust of the Emperor Tiberius was intended to be a complete contrast with the scene below. Manet and Cézanne made particular studies of this great religious masterpiece, and the former actually painted the same scene in the mid-1860s in homage to the Venetian master. Now, two major artists, uh, Tintoretto and Veronese, survived the elderly Titian to dominate painting in Venice in the late 16th century. Tintoretto's representation of paradise in the coronation study is among the most compelling in the history of art. No ordinary mortals are permitted. Tintoretto represents paradise as a sequence of cloudy floors on which sits various saints, figures from the Old Testament, and other significant figures, as Christ crowns his mother, the Virgin Mary. Look at right here in the middle of the painting. Though already a large painting, this is a study or visual proposal for an immense fresco in the most important civic building in Venice, the Doge's Palace, decorated by Titian, Tintoretto, Palma Vecchio, and Veronese. Yet even this glorious painting pales in comparison with Veronese's The Marriage at Cana, commissioned from the artist for the refectory, or the dining room, of the Benedictine Monastery on the island of San Giorgio in Venice, and delivered in 1563. With 134 life-size figures, there is no more splendid Venetian painting in the world than this. Now, when it arrived at the Louvre in 1801, it served as a pictorial model for the great French painter and Louvre director, Jacques-Louis David, when he painted the coronation of the Empress Josephine for Napoleon in 1804 through 1808. Now, the most original and important painter in Baroque Italy was um, Michelangelo Merisi de Caravaggio, referred to simply as Caravaggio, who burst onto the scene in Rome early into the 17th century and led a famously scandalous and complex life in Rome, Malta, and Sicily before dying in Naples in 1610. His paintings represented the vernacular subjects of the teeming Roman streets, inserting into high art a jolt of social and moral electricity, uh, electricity from which is uh, from which it would never fully recover. Now, arguably, the most influential painter in Europe after Raphael, 
Caravaggio had a profound effect on Spanish, Flemish, Dutch, German, and French art from 1600 until 1900. Now, the paintings by Caravaggio um, and his circle in the Louvre Two are unquestioned masterpieces, and both entered France as part of the collection of Louis XIV. The earlier of the two, The Fortune Teller, was painted when Caravaggio was in his 20s. We witnessed the encounter, most probably in the streets of Rome, between a wealthy and handsome young man and an itinerant female fortune teller. The painting is part of a series of similarly um, proportioned works that relate to themes of luck, lust, and fortune among the social strata in modern society. Now, by far, the greatest of the works of Caravaggio outside Italy, uh, The Death of the Virgin, was commissioned from the artists by um, Larzirio Cherubini for the Roman Church of Santa Maria della Scala a Travasvere in 1605. The painting was rejected by the clergy at the church because the model for the dead virgin was identified as a prostitute, and because the other figures in the painting were associated with Roman street criminals. No less a connoisseur than Peter Paul Rubens arranged for the purchase of the painting uh, by, the by the Gonzaga family, who, said, uh, who sold it to Charles I. The first great royal collector of Baroque painting a northern Euro of Northern Europe. Now, Louis XIV bought uh, it from a dealer after the dissolution of that collection following the revolution in England. Now, the mute poetry of the painting, its dramatic lighting, and its extraordinary use of drapery to convey emotion make it among the greatest masterpieces of European religious painting of the early 17th century, and to some extent, even prefigure the religious paintings of the Protestant master Rembrandt. So as you go back and look through these paintings, um, hopefully you notice some of the, uh, the, even though a lot of these were religious, there were some secular paintings that were thrown in here as well. And as you're going through this, uh, a couple questions to think about is, you know, what role uh, do the Italian paintings in the Louvre play in the museum's collection? And like I said, a lot of these were acquired uh, and seen as, um, the experts in the field, those in Italy moving to France, and why are they important and what's the historical significance of the paintings. And finally, uh, as you go through here, if you watch this again, think to yourself, you know, which is your favorite Italian painting in the Louvre and why? Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this little presentation on Italian and Baroque masterpieces in the Louvre in Paris. Um, and I hope I will be, I'll be putting together more of these lectures uh, in the future. And I hope you enjoyed this little walk through the Louvre and uh, understanding the art of the time.